uh, at our own volition, we'll just volunteer ourselves uh, to some of our largest filers. Um, on these visits, we tend not to get too involved in hardware issues and installing equipment, uh, but we do look at the attorney's computer settings and configurations, uh, particularly if they're having connections or performance problems. And now this is a new and growing customer service we're providing, uh, and I must say it's been very well received by the bar. Uh, in fact, uh, it's helped catapult our participation rate to, to well over 50% of the practicing bankruptcy bar in the area here. Well, that's, that's tremendous, Mark. Thanks, thanks so much. Um, I, we have Gary Drake on the line now, and I'd like to, um, I know, Gary, that the Northern District of, of Georgia is very, very active in, in CMECF, um, one of those courts that jumped on the bandwagon so early in the, in the game. Uh, but I would like you to focus on something else, because I know that you've developed a bankruptcy-related program for probation and pretrial services officers. Explain a little bit about why you did that. Uh, thank you, Bob. Uh, we did create a PowerPoint presentation that we have presented to probation pretrial services in the Northern District of Georgia, and it is based directly on the Bankruptcy Basics Public Information Series published by the Administrative Office. Uh, I was approached by one of the Deputy Chief Probation Officers about making this presentation because they were seeing in their work a growing number of defendants with a bankruptcy history. And they were uncertain of the bankruptcy process or even what the different chapters represented. Uh, the presentation was very well received by the probation pretrial officers there, and I suspect we'll be making this in the future as they bring additional officers on board. Uh, this is a presentation that would be appropriate for any other court uh, unit as well as any other government agency, and we'll be making that available to those people within our uh, area here. Uh, and additionally, I did have the opportunity to make this same presentation to two high school banking and finance classes over the past year, a little bit beyond the reach of our normal customer in the bankruptcy court, but any education of the public is useful. I think it's exciting to hear about some of these uh, these programs, and that sounds like a wonderful program. We'd love to have a copy of your, uh, your agenda, Gary. <laughs> Um, let's turn our attention now to, to other uh, assistance given, uh, that is to other groups, and let's start with, uh, with debtor education. This is a kind of a hot topic, especially with the possibility of uh, bankruptcy reform uh, legislation. Uh, I'm going to call on John Soretto again to uh, just take one minute, if you will, to explain your court's debtor assistance program. How does that work, John? Well, hello again, Bob. Hi. Uh, in the Central District, we have a pro se litigant uh, which ranges between 30 and 40 percent of our filings depending on the year. So clearly uh, that's a number that can't be ignored or wished away. And with regards to what we've done in our court, you know, we have a dual track approach, uh, which is a directed public information outreach program and some pro bono programs which we have implemented with our local bar. Now with regards to the information outreach, we're <clears throat> probably similar to other courts in that we provide bankruptcy education materials, and we also provide uh, forms packages for both uh, Chapter 7 and 13. We also we provide both those in English and in Spanish. Now, of course, the objective is not to encourage filings, but to increase the likelihood that the courts will receive you know, properly completed legal documents and save time. But a program that we're very proud with that we've developed in conjunction with our local bar association is a, uh, a pro bono program which addresses reaffirmation agreements and 523 dischargeability actions. Uh, basically, the program is, is quite simple, that the attorneys are required to provide in their notices uh, a notice of legal representation availability to low-income uh, debtors who are pro se via the debtor assistance program. And here again, that's sponsored, use, sponsored using our uh, local public counsel, which is our local uh, legal clinic. And essentially, for example, with regards to the reaffirmation agreements, the judges within a particular division, and we have five divisions and 21 judges, uh, will schedule all the reaffirmation agreements for a single day. And then they'll rotate, uh, and a single judge will hear all those reaffirmation agreements. And prior to the hearing, we will have a volunteer attorney which will come from the local bar and basically explain to the pro se uh, debtor uh, on these reaffirmation agreements what their rights are prior to walking into the hearing. 
Now, in this particular case, the attorneys do not represent the, uh, the litigant, but they provide a lot of information, which makes the, uh, makes the judge's job a lot easier with regards to these reaffirmation agreements. And we have a, a similar program, as I said, with regards to non-dischargeability. Non, uh, that's great. Now, one thing on these programs I think is very important uh, is that they don't really happen by themselves. The judges really have to get behind it and work with the local bar and make it happen. Even if the bar is very supportive, it really requires uh, the judicial uh, initiative there. John, thank you so much. Um, I want to turn back to, uh, to Mark Hatcher. And, uh, Mark, I believe you have you've developed a program with Washington Western. And do I understand that you have classes for debtors? conducted right immediately after the 341 meeting? Uh, yeah, yes, we do, Bob. Uh, the, the judges here in this district believe debtor education is a legitimate function for the court and that debtors should be provided um, some financial planning tools to hopefully avoid bankruptcy in the future. Um, our court has taken what I'd describe as a gentle approach in this regard. Uh, we use uh, education materials, uh, including videos that have been developed by Visa, and we provide a room uh, in the same building as the 341 meetings uh, for debtors to simply come down after their 341 meeting and um, view the videos and take the materials if they choose to. Uh, the materials are free. Uh, they're surprisingly non-promotional as to Visa. Uh, and attendance at the classes is voluntary. Uh, we've actually had debtors express their appreciation for the minute for the information, and uh, actually had some lament that they wish they would have had that sort of information available to them years earlier. No, that's great. Uh, that's great, Mark. Uh, let's move on to pro se filers. And Kathleen, I know in in your court, you've uh, you have a number of efforts, including a handbook for pro se filers, and so forth. Talk a little bit about that. We do. Before I get into that, I would like to talk a little bit about, uh, in order to uh, help the staff understand the pro se filer, we held some, we conducted some uh, programs. We had a uh, law professor come in and do a profile of a typical debtor. And I think everyone was a little surprised how close that they really were to bankruptcy themselves and it sort of gave it a personal perspective. We had an attorney come in to sort of explain uh, the interview with his client and how he get, comes to the decision that he, do, he will file for bankruptcy for that. So that they have an understanding of the people that they're dealing with they do, when they do come into the counter. Um, we have a court services coordinator uh, right at the intake counter to assist the pro se filer through the, through the uh, initial filing. Um, we'll not give legal advice, but we'll give procedural advice. We have the we have uh, handbooks for our, for intake, just a little pamphlet to sort of explain what that is. We have, as I referred to before, the uh, survival guide to the records room, so that people know how to get information. Uh, the handbook is rather extensive, so the court servants coordinator will uh, direct them to the appropriate section of that. We hope to have that available on our website very shortly in a searchable format, so it can be of use to. Uh, people for free of, for free, and we'll, it's got all the forms in it, and it's got some simple explanations of the different chapters, and uh, how to file a motion, how to file mm -hmm. an appeal. Um, so it doesn't just deal with the pro se debtor; it deals with uh, pro se creditors as well. Right, and this is going on the web. Hopefully, it will be on the web soon. Yes. Good. Uh, I believe we have Ken Gardner, Clerk of Court from uh, Illinois Northern on our Push to Talk line, as well as Chief Judge Susan Sonderby. And uh, I want to thank the judge for being available now. And I want to backtrack just a little bit uh, before I ask Ken a question. Uh, judge Sonderby, you have the Kmart case. And uh, how do you use the web to keep interested parties, uh, including the media and the rest of the public, informed? How's that worked? Well, our goal is to um, give the public as much access to as much information as possible. Of course, that's going to sell, save our court staff time and effort in responding to inquiries. So we've set up a web page on our website, and it includes a case management or a case procedures order, a bar date order, a proof of claim uh, information, and the case docket, amongst other things. Uh, we also have links to the websites of Debtors' Council, the U.S. Trustee, the noticing agent for the case, 
um, information uh, regarding things of that nature. We also include pertinent information such as uh, phone numbers, addresses, bar dates, next hearing date and location of it. I've had to conduct hearings in this case in the district court courtroom because of the magnitude of lawyers that come in. A uh, couple things that we found uh, rather uh, helpful also were to have the attorneys sign in and state their name and who they represented on a paper which is then is filed and is introduced into evidence in the, as part of the court record. This is because hundred lawyers and it would take us um, at any one hearing uh, quite an expenditure of time to get all those appearances as part of the record. Uh, one of the, the other thing that we do is we have links to the hearing agendas. Every omnibus hearing date that I have, the debtor about three days before the hearing sends me an agenda and it lists all of the items that have been noticed for that day with docket numbers as well as all of the responses, objections, and some guidance as to what is expected on that day. And that way we can uh, gain information as to what is going to go ahead for oral arguments, what I'll take testimony on, what will be continued, withdrawn, or settled. And so it's very helpful. But a real key here is to put a docket number with everything that is listed on that agenda. One other thing I wanted to mention in the Kmart case was the volume of pages in the Statement of Affairs and Schedules. There were some 14,000 pages. So we had debtors' counsel file in a CD-ROM format all of that information. We merged it into our, our um, system. It was immediately accessible up on the web page, on our website, and um, so that anybody could gain that information immediately. The press, of course, wanted copies of the CD-ROM, and we had that available, too, because we burned different copies. It's a wonderful use of tech technology, not just the web, but the Absolutely. use of CD-ROM to get that information out. Thank you again so much, Judge Sonnery. Uh, Ken, if you'll comment uh, just for a minute on the district's pro se assistance efforts. We've talked about this before, and I understand the, the attorneys contribute time and expertise pro bono. How does that work? Uh, yes, Bob. What we have done is we have created basically an, an attorney help desk which allows pro se filers to come in on Friday for three hours, staffed by an attorney. We've given them clerk's office space as well as we give them a clerk's office employee to help with some of the administrative matters. And uh, basically the program allows uh, the attorneys, using a volunteer attorney from the uh, Chicago Bar Association, to come in and counsel these debtors with, uh, you know, just information and things that, that happen. Um, a lot of times the judges will refer in, you know, matters that get particularly, uh, you know, particularly legal in nature in the, in the courtroom will refer the, the debtors to this, to this program so they can come in and get some additional assistance. Thanks so much, Ken. We now have uh, Jody Troxler on the line. And Jody is the Chapter 13 Standing Trustee for the Middle District of North Carolina. Uh, Jody, tell us about this Chapter 13's debtors school uh, in the Middle District. I understand that that has been in existence for uh, about 30 years. Uh, that's correct. Um, I'm one of three Chapter 13 trustees in this district, and we do have a formal um, 13 debtor school that is um, held, and the school um, goes over budgeting and credit issues, as well as some... Um, bankruptcy information such as terminology to try to help the individuals um, understand what they'll be going through in Chapter 13. The um, school is held on the morning of 341. The 341s are for 13s are in the afternoon and there is a three-hour class um, in the morning where the individuals um, attend the class. We have um, in the district we have two budget counselors who work with the three trustees offices and they hold the classes throughout the district um, and we use as our core materials um, written materials and videos which are now available through the Trustees Education Network which is or commonly known as TIN which is an organization, that, a nonprofit organization that was developed a few years ago by Chapter 13 trustees to try to provide uh, core curriculum in this area that, um, and the materials were developed by Chapter 13 trustees. Um, the, and this provides um, the source for the 10 offers trustees who have either been in this business a long time with the debtor education or new tr uh, trustees who are just getting into it with the materials and other education information that can help them. Um, the budget counselors, in addition to working with them, the 13 debtors in the schools, um, also will 
can offer one-on-one -on -one budgeting or meetings with debtors if they desire. And the budget counselors also go out into the community voluntarily to participate in seminars and that type of thing, um, especially in the budgeting area. And they're very popular with our college areas uh, when they do special seminars in this area. Jody, thank you very much. And I know you forwarded the uh, agenda to me and some of the, uh, uh, the parts of the program. And we're going to make sure that we put that on our court operations exchange for folks who might be interested. Uh, Judge Kenner, I know in Boston you have a pro se reaffirmation clinic. Uh, we do. Talk a little we bit do. about it's, that. We uh, do. It's initiated by the Boston Bar Association. And as one of the uh, speakers earlier noted, the judges have agreed in, in Boston to have all of the reaffirmation hearings for pro se debtors on the same day uh, at about the same time so that uh, it's convenient for the judges, it's convenient for the um, attorneys who are donating their time. And, no, expertise. That's great. and I know you use the web uh, quite a bit to uh, put information out we as well. We, we do use the web a great deal, uh, it, much like, like you do in the Southern District. Um, I think one aspect that we're finding very useful for prospective bidders at auctions and private sales is we post all of our notices of sale on the web so that a, a person who's interested in buying a house in Worcester can, uh, uh, can, can offer a bid. And hopefully we've expanded the universe of people who will bid in bankruptcy sales and thereby increase the price. We've emphasized a lot the use of websites to provide uh, valuable information to the public. And I know that there are a number of, uh, of districts that, uh, that uh, use the web to post their uh, uh, little messages, if you will, some newsletters uh, and what have you. Um, um, we did have Martha Labus and also uh, David, I had wanted to talk to you, but we're going to move to another subject in that area just to let you know that, those, uh, that the website is in fact used to uh, uh, foreign newsletters to get the, get the word out to people, both uh, individual districts and also in partnerships with bar associations. But I want to move to another subject now because um, we, when we looked at the various websites out there, we noticed um, that um, just a few of them include information relating to unclaimed funds. And uh, Louisiana Middle, I think, is a great example. And we have uh, Monica Minier on the line to explain that effort. Monica. Yes, Bob. We put our unclaimed funds on our website a couple of years ago. We decided that uh, this would be another um, helpful tool for the public to have. We uh, print out the uh, unclaimed funds from fences. We scan it in, make it a PDF, and we put it on our website. It's not a searchable um, document, but they can certainly view it and review it. And um, they have claims finders and creditors both have appreciated that. They no longer have to come down to the court and pull the files, uh, pull the records and look at them. Our financial administrator is not disrupted from her work either on the telephone or with claims finders um, coming into the office. So it's been helpful both to the court and to the public. Thanks so much, Monica. Let's open it up now for any push to talk uh, participants that might want to uh, ask a question of our, uh, of our panel. Anybody out there? We mentioned, uh, okay, uh, well, if, if you want to ask a question later, by all means, we'll open it up one more time. We mentioned before the use of, uh, of uh, feedback from how important it is to get feedback from the, from the courts, uh, from the folks out there. And um, let me ask the panel members how you use it. Uh, Kathleen. Well, certainly we actively solicit feed feedback on certain things that we put out on our website. Um, when we make presentations to various bar associations and law firms, um, we certainly solicit feedback from them. Uh, sometimes we get unsolicited feedback. Matter of fact, a lot we get unsolicited feedback. Most of it good, though, on, on the uh, good side of it. Um, but if on the occasion that there is something that should be addressed, uh, we will address it, and we appreciate the uh, courts, co the the, uh, po the constituents coming back to us and letting us know what we're doing right, and on the other hand, what we could improve. We're not, we don't necessarily do it wrong, but we might need a little <laughs> improvement. <laughs> Let me dovetail on what Kathleen is saying, that it's too easy when you have an offhanded comment that appears in a suggestion box to discount it, and you just really cannot do that. You have to take every input you get seriously, consider it, consider the source, 
uh, and, and review it and see if it, you really can contribute to improving your operation and improving your customer service. Okay. Rebecca. Well, this really is an important part of outreach because outreach is so hard to measure. So what we have done is we have a written evaluation at every program. Every participant uh, answers the questions that we pose. In fact, sometimes they have to exchange their evaluation to get their certificate. It's that important to us. And we identify trends and then we really do incorporate that feedback into our next year's program. We also do videotaped exit interviews and that in that way we get to see the attitudes change. We get to see what kind of an emotional impact the program had on the students. And then also with the courthouse coordinators. We touch base with them by phone in, during the planning process. We actually uh, talk to them in, in the very beginning in designing the process, then during the process of planning and execution, and then afterwards we do a debriefing and that's just hugely helpful to us. Judge, any comments about uh, feedback mechanisms? And I think the courts always have to be listening to what the public is saying. I think we have to um, reach out and find ways to, to uh, gather information in lots of different ways, whether it's um, uh, with over-the-counter at the public counter, whether it's via the internet, whether it's talking to uh, state court judges, for example, at, at bar association functions. I think we always have to be listening. Absolutely. That's great. Um, it's been a great discussion. I, we did, in fact, receive one uh, additional uh, a fax, and it relates to the programs that uh, you, you noted before, Rebecca. We're considering reaching out to students uh, in the community. What age group should we target, first of all, and uh, what kinds of programs do you think capture students' in, uh, uh, interest and attention? Well, the national initiatives are geared for high school seniors because these, this is the age group where students are eligible to register to vote or they are registered to vote, and as you know, that's a way to get into the jury pool. So what we do is we present jury uh, service as a rite of passage along with voting and the other privileges and responsibilities of adulthood. But we really don't limit ourselves to that. Our lesson plans are geared for ninth through 12th graders. Our key audience really is teachers because we know if we reach one teacher, that teacher uh, touches the lives of hundreds of thousands, or thousands I should say, maybe sometimes they touch generations of students. And uh, then also, um, in addition to that, we, uh, I've lost my train of thought. Oh, that's okay. That's okay. We have another oh, fact. Oh, oh, I wanted to say, yes, here we are. Um, yes, but judges really should feel free to reach out to the age groups that they're comfortable with. If it's second graders, if it's fifth graders, when you have a rapport, please, uh, do that and also outreach didn't start three years ago when I joined the federal court system. Many judges have a career's worth of experience and uh, we certainly acknowledge and appreciate that. Uh, related to that, um, uh, Judge Kenner, here's a fax for you. Are uh, there recommendations that you could give to approach a judge to help us uh, champion these outreach programs? Maybe I shouldn't ask Good that. Good question. <laughs> Good question. Can I take that under advisement? Judge, <laughs> <laughs> you're on the record. Go. <laughs> I think, you know, some judges are comfortable doing this. Other judges are, are, are comfortable doing different things. You know, I like working with school-age kids. Some of my colleagues um, work with law students, work with the bar. We all, we all find a, a niche that we're comfortable with. Um, we've just about reached the end of this uh, of, of this particular session and this broadcast. So one last question um, for our uh, our panel here. One liners, please. What's the bottom line in terms of uh, developing an outreach successful outreach program? Kathleen. Um, first of all, get a commitment from your staff. Make sure that they understand that the uh, outreaching and customer service is part of the court's mission, and. Um, Take every opportunity available to get word out there, uh, either do it in person or do it electronically, but use every available avenue that you may have at your finger at your disposal. That's great. Kathleen? Actually, Rebecca. Oh, Rebecca, I'm that's sorry. That's just fine. <laughs> uh, I would say to start small and to keep the theme in place, low investment, high impact. So you want to expend as few resources as you can, but think about how can I make the most of those resources? Uh, Public affairs and outreach really is a planned, systematic, cohesive kind of a program. So make sure that it works together to support your strategic plan. Make sure that it advances the outcomes that you really want to see in your community. Great. David. Uh, more technology is better. People are becoming more accustomed to using the web, so the better 
you can use that to get your message across, the better off you will be. Um, you need to provide a mechanism for inputs to improve your operation, and you need to take those inputs seriously when a customer takes the time to provide them. Right. Judge Kenner, the final word. I guess I would say be flexible and keep listening. Okay. Uh, that about does it. Uh, I want to thank our panelists for this second session, uh, session Judge Kenner, Kathleen Farrell, David Oliveira, and Rebecca Fanning, and also Regina Bivens and Sandy Poindexter, as well as our push to talkers and, and phone in participants. Before I come back with some final thoughts, here are a few points to remember about community outreach and education. Today we've taken a look at the public information and outreach activities and some of the challenges and practices proven to be effective for our panelists and push to talk participants. I hope you found this broadcast to be informative and directly related to what you do on the job. Let me remind you to please complete an evaluation that was part of your downloadable materials on the DCN. We appreciate your feedback. Also, we invite you to access the Court Operations Exchange on the FJC homepage. There you'll find information that courts have posted and are sharing with colleagues throughout the federal court system. In addition, you can ask a question and be part of a discussion on specific court-related topics. It's a great resource. I want to thank again our panelists and all Push to Talk participants for being so willing to share their experiences in this important subject area. That's such a vital part of the learning process. And a special thanks to David Sellers and the staff of the Administrative Office, the Public Affairs Office, for partnering with us in this effort. In closing, a lot of what we've discussed today deals with communicating effectively. In his work on leadership wisdom, Larry Liberty notes that communication is more than just speaking and being understood. It's about clarity of thinking, willingness to listen, and the desire to see what someone else sees exactly the way they see things. It rests upon generosity and courage as much as skill. Thank you again for joining us today. Keep an eye on the FJTN Bulletin for other upcoming programs of interest to all court staff. And we'll see you on our next FJTN broadcast.